Papa! Gregory! Greg Papa's going to join us on the podcast today. Uh, voice of the 49ers, former voice of the uh, Oakland Raiders, Oakland A's, and San Francisco Giants. Mentor and friend to both of us for many years, I would say. Yes. And uh, all around great guy. You know, when you go like, he, you know, the best thing I can say about him. He's a, he's a great player, but he's an even better person. Mm -hmm. He's a fantastic broadcaster, but he's even cooler in person. That's true. That's the way I describe him. Yeah. For those of you who don't live in the Bay Area, maybe aren't around the Bay Area, we get people who you know aren't necessarily Bay Area sports fans that listen to us, but we used to work at a radio station, and Greg, uh, we worked with Greg, and um, and now he does a show with our buddy John Lund, Pop and Lund, on KMBR 680 in the Bay Area. Um. But it's hard to, you got to think about if you live in a big city where there's like a Hawk Harrelson or uh, that type of guy, you know, like that's what Papa is in the Bay Area. He is part of his legendary status is that there are a lot of people with stories about the night they were just hanging out drinking at some random bar with Greg Papa over the years. Yeah, see, that's what I would say is the most unique part is that he's done every team in the Bay Area. He's called Warriors Games on television. He's done both baseball teams and now he's done both football teams. <laughs> And he's done a radio show off and on for decades. But, like, I, I can only, the only other major city I've lived in this big sports would be Philly, and Merrill Reese is older. But if, like, Merrill Reese was also, like, you could just hit him, you just see him at, like, downtown bars, like, he'd buy you drinks, and he was just fun. Like, everyone, he does that. Like, he's a very sociable individual. He's a man of the people. Yeah, he's a man of the people. He's a man of the people, and he is a fan. He's fantastic. At everything he does. And one thing I always learned from he is so detailed. He's really sharp, so detail oriented. I remember the first time I noticed him. He was talking about. He said something like, uh, uh, "It was. I don't think it was the flight number of a of a team plane, but it was the time that they landed. You know, like the Raiders touched down in Tallahassee at five thirty two today. You know, like I was like, that's that's cool. I like that." Al Davis uh, once thought about naming him the general manager. Remember? Was going to, I think, name him the general. We didn't talk about that in this uh, podcast, but uh, so much great stuff. So uh, let's get to it, John. The great Greg Papa. We're rolling. Uh, I guess the question is who wants to ask a hypothetical question first? John had one and I had one, each for Greg. So, John, why don't All you right. go? By the way, always yeah, hypothetical we, away. Uh, hi, Greg. I thought it involves Jimmy Garoppolo, your hypothesis. Neither one involves Jimmy. Oh, no. Uh, I was I asked Guy this the other day, and I, and I do think it's possible. The Oakland A's started counting real humans at their stadium a couple years ago, right? So, that, you know, they'd announced 2,800 or 32. Is there a chance this season, a weekday game against the shittiest opponent middle of the summer, Less than a thousand people are inside the Oakland Coliseum for for a major and they league baseball game. Less than a thousand, or you're saying physically less than a thousand? Yeah, they announced nine hundred and thirty eight people. Well, there was a game back in the seventies, and this was during the dynastic run. It may have been just post, you know, seventy two, seventy three, seventy four, when they won three in a row. And they also won five straight American League Wests, seventy one through seventy five. But there was a game. I want to say 673 showed up. I don't know why that number is in my brain, but that's when the great Captain Sal, Sal Bando, the third baseman of those great teams, called it the Oakland Mausoleum and not the Coliseum. So, and it may have been after they traded Reggie. I think it may have been that year, maybe 76, but um, they had 673. So I think it's possible, but you don't think Dave Cavill's an idiot. He's not, they're not going to announce that. They're going to come up with some way to to fabricate that. I wonder if there's ever been an A's game I did on a Tuesday night uh, or a Monday night against Tampa Bay where we had 673. Here you going. April 17, 1979. Now, I think that was even – I think there's one earlier. It says we they announced 650 people. <laughs> they sold 653 tickets that night, but Wait, by what, all what, accounts, half the number what showed was the number up. Number I said 673 or 653. How close? 673. Was that? So I was off by two. You were close. Was yeah, Sal says, still a, was was Sal, was Sal still an A then? 
you know, before Craig, our time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did watch the documentary on those teams on uh, MLB no, Network. Team, it was pretty good. This was I mean, Jim Marshall was the manager. It may have been the worst team in A's history. It was because Mitchell Page, uh, the Rage, the Mitchell Rage Page, uh, he was the rookie of the year. I think it was 77. So, but the 79 team, they lost 100 games. Was that not Jim Marshall, the manager? And it was right before they hired Billy Martin and turned the whole thing around. So, I believe that's correct. He's gonna what go would you say in, in, in all your years of doing NFL football? You've seen some shitty Raider teams, but just I'm sure you guys have played some bad teams. Has there ever been a game that looked like 15,000 people were in the stands or anything? No. Or is the football just the Raiders, when, we, when we weren't on television and we technically didn't have sellouts? The blackout. We still, yeah. we still had, you know, the blackouts. We still had 50,000. I remember a game my first year, the last game of the year in 97, we're playing Jacksonville. They were bad. That was Joe Bugle's team, and Al was going to fire them. They were, uh-huh. they were dead last in the NFL in defense, and they were dead last in run defense and pass defense, which is like mathematically almost impossible. And I remember that game. They fed the ball to Tim Brown. I think he caught like 15, 16 passes to get to 100. And I'm like, what are we doing? It was awful. And it was pouring rain. And um, we still had, as bad as the Raiders were, you're still going to have 45, 50,000 there. You may not sell it all the way to the top to Mount Davis to get the blackout lifted. But no, not for an NFL game. I remember going like, when I was doing A's on the road to like Tropicana Field, and they were so yeah. bad that it felt like, I mean, a fly ball was like an echo. Yeah. You could hear everything. So I, I bet I had some games where it was maybe less than 2,000, but not 653. It's coming. Actually I, feel, I feel confident. But I, I think, I don't know, God, what do you think? You think we could have an A's game this year on a Monday night? where they would draw less than a thousand. I think that's possible this year. Uh, yeah. I've gone back and forth. I do think they would announce it if they did. I think they want people. It would be, ac- it would be accurate. I think they'd want it to so be accurate. Go to Vegas. Yeah. I remember a, uh, a giants Rays game many years ago <coughs> where, uh, where one can- of the, at, at, in uh, Pac Bell Tropicana. Oh, there. Yeah. 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 And one, one of the Rays hit a home run. I remember listening to it on radio. This is many years, you know, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago. And John Miller really playing it up. And going, listen to this crowd, you know, and then of course there's no sound because uh, there wasn't. Except no the crowd. one guy you heard behind home plate was Dick Vitale <laughs> screaming, "He's a diaper dandy, he's a PT peer." That was a good hype. My hypothetical okay, that was, was that was a good hypothetical. Mine is who plays more games next year, Javon Kinlaw or James Wiseman? Wow, you're talking start fresh. You realize basketball plays 82. I know. And football plays uh, – are we counting preseason games? No. But Kinlaw's healthy right now. Yeah, I'm – Working know. outside the Kyle's hey. office, you know. Well, who played more <laughs> games this past year? Javon Kinlaw by a smidge. <laughs> we count the G League? Well, because well, zero. We all – we not talk. What did you – Wiseman play three? How many Kinlaw play? He played more than that. Yeah. Did I Kinlaw think. play a game this year? Yeah. When did he have surgery? I don't remember seeing him. I, I remember him Kinlaw in – Kinlaw played. Let me look it up. Anyway, Wiseman did not play a, uh, an so NBA basketball go, game. These are good hypotheticals. Kinlaw played four. Can this I year. Borrow, yeah, so can I, can I, I'm going to borrow these. Up. Four to three, including the G League. I'm going Kinlaw. Yeah. This could be a Holer's Big Pole on Pop and Lund on Friday. I like that. <laughs> these are good hypotheticals. Like so you them. think Wiseman's more likely to be Greg Oden than Kinlaw be? No. I don't. I think we're I think we're assuming – Let's not say Greg Oden or Sam Bowie. Let's let's slow our roll. It is concerning. He's a big man that had, you know, he has got a big meniscus tear. He's got a big knee. And I remember, uh, like, Jeff Wilson Jr. of the 49ers tore his meniscus. And I think they told me it was a 10 suture repair, which is, like, a lot for a knee. So it was pretty bad. And I, I don't know what, what uh, James Wiseman's was. But I, it, obviously, to have inflammation building up twice, not a good sign. And he had the follow-up scope in December. He may have to have – they may not be telling us the truth. He may be having one right now. But I'm, let's, let's not jump to conclusions on something like that because medical science is, is far advanced. So I, to say he's never going to play and he's going to be Odin, that's people hyperventilating and overreacting. Kinlaw had an existing knee injury going back to college. And when he banged it, and I remember the play, he was chasing Andy Dalton down in, in Arlington. 
and uh, it was a bad one. It wasn't. It was a you know banging the knee on that hard field turf there, and it was unyielding. So, uh, but I, I I mean hopefully both guys will get over it and have long careers. But um, as far as the here and now, it's a concern. They're both high draft picks, obviously. But I would say uh, it's hard for me to say without talking to a doctor. And Dr. Schwartz passed on me, so I. I miss him every day. Um, he would have insight into that. But I would say, uh, as far as next year, Wiseman's got to play more games. He's, he's got to play more than 17, right? I mean, if the 49ers play four playoff games, we're not cutting preseason. He's got to wild play. Card, wild card team, huh? He's, he's got to play more than 21 <laughs> games. Well, if they're the number one seed, we're good. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. What's the nice hypothetical? That was it. I think. Do you do you have a hypothetical, Greg? I got one. Okay, go. And I, I, I I'm surprised we're not talking football. I'm, I'm impressed. We got an We got a lot of football. I'm to talk. Uh, I wore my hat for you. I thought we were going. There. Is he, yeah. Next, oh, we're going. We're going. I didn't, going. I, didn't, I didn't shower much after the show, so I'm going. <laughs> um, sure got home fast though. If Deshaun Watson <laughs> gets suspended or put on the commissioner's exempt list, and Baker Mayfield is somehow removed from the roster of the Cleveland Browns. Would the Cleveland Browns make a trade for Jimmy, Jimmy Subway, Jimmy uh, Italiano? Col- Jimmy, Jimmy Cold Cuts. Nana. Jimmy Gabagool. Nana. What? Wait, what? Uh, Deshaun got suspended. And then, you know, they've got Jacoby Brissett. But he backed up Jimmy. He's a, he's, a, he's a backup. He's backed up Jimmy in New England. It was Brady. It was it was Bray. It was Jimmy, and it was Gar- it was uh, Brissett. So my hypothetical, and those aren't those are not outlandish. Those are plausible, right? What are you hearing? Is Deshaun going to get suspended? Commissioner's exempt list, something. And if he misses eight, 10, 12 games, would you? And they trade Baker. Would you trust Baker to be your backup? Would he no. do the job? So you know, if say Deshaun gets twelve games. He comes back. Jimmy could make it nine and three versus three and nine. Wouldn't they do that? So could the market change? And specifically, Jimmy Garoppolo go to go to Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski and the Haslam's. Well, we have an added hypothetical, I think, with another Jimmy trade. That's a pretty good one. But with oh, yeah. that one, my only question would be: He makes twenty-seven million. So are they asking him to take a pay cut to facilitate the trade? And well, two, Baker's the- gone. So eighteen six gone. Yeah, but it's still a $9 million swing. It's still a lot of money. Like, to me, the the suspension, I've been telling people, I think they could suspend them a year. It's just like an F you. Like, you've dragged our name through the mud, the league. This has been a bad deal. Not like Jimmy Haslam has a ton of equity, right? Yeah, they the way they set up the salary, the way they set up the salary was like, it does. you could spend them a year. It doesn't matter his money. So it's like, okay, you want to see us spend them a year? I could see that. And maybe maybe Parag and the guys kind of know that and are hoping because he fits the offense. But the uh, but I still think if they give him eight games, he would have to take a dramatic pay cut for them to facilitate it to me, because then Jimmy. But also, G, but then Jimmy would just be cool with like I just get. Obviously, Deshaun's better than him. He just goes to the bench. He doesn't have much. What's he gonna do? Hold no. I mean, then the Browns flip. He the Browns flip. Five mil. He's got to go where he's traded. Then the you know, Browns flip gone. him at the trade deadline. And that that's his offense is that's that's Gary Kubiak. Well, that's, that's where. That's where we get. That's where we get the other hypothetical oh. of the Carolina Panthers. Okay, and so you don't big, like my hypothetical? What, what, I don't. I don't hate it. I just. I just. To, yeah. Before to, you get to the next one, John. Hold on. Before you get to the next one, though, just do the Browns then flip Jimmy at the deadline? Depends on Deshaun's suspension and where we're and, at. And what are the Browns trading the Niners? Are they giving them a third round pick? Well, I, I, if you want to save the year, I think Cleveland with Deshaun Watson on it is a Super Bowl. Is a bit, you know the AFC's loaded, so it yeah. may not turn out that way. But that's a really good roster. If they lose to Sean, and I, I won't, I'm not going to trust Baker to be the backup now. He's, he's pouting like a child. Yeah, he can't. Whether they move him, cut him, trade him, whatever they do, they'll move him around the draft, something. Brissett's a nice player, but I think he's a one or two game stopgap. And I heard Stefanski going on and on about him. He's a great backup. Yeah, he's a great backup until you have to play him. And Jimmy's a better player. We all acknowledge that. I mean, that could be the difference of coming out of the Watson suspension exempt list, whatever takes them off the field with a chance in November, you know, to go make the playoffs and win. So I, I think that's, I mean, where do you get me on the hypothetical? That, that's no, no, I don't, I don't plausible. hate it. I, Isn't that plausible or possible? You just see, he makes a ton of money. Now 
uh, Jacoby doesn't make money. anything, make, make and neither does Watson. You, you can move the money around. You can make the money work. Yeah, and by the time we get to the end, by the time we get to the end of the preseason, if the Niners are in a position where no one's acquiring Jimmy for twenty seven million dollars, and they're going to cut him if they have to before guaranteeing his contract, then you're Don Yee. You're not going to get eighteen million dollars on the open market. You take a ten million dollar. But pay. but suspe- but suspensions usually kick in week one, right? So you would want Watson to practice because he hasn't played in forever. So does Jimmy? They split reps in camp. How does that work? Well, That'd what is tricky. then? You know, if he fights these civil lawsuits, maybe not all twenty-two, but he fights some of them, then is is uh, Goodell paralyzed until those are somehow resolved? Do you, I mean, do you have to? If he res- if he re- if he pays one off, is that enough of an admission of guilt? And then what evidence do they have? So he could either expedite it or delay whatever punishments coming his way by how he, he and Rusty Harden choose to handle. The civil suit. So I don't know. I mean, that's just something I'm thinking about where the market is. I don't see Jimmy going really anywhere else. Uh, Houston, are they going to do that with Casario? Maybe. No, no. no. Okay, Davis Mills. Is-, another, is there another hypothetical you have for Jimmy? No, no. I mean, you saw Davis Mills up front. Don't you think he's a pretty intriguing player? I like him. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, Steve, Steve Baker was my agent for years with Steinberg and Morad, and he's been in my ear all year. You know, I have to trade up and get Trey Lance, just draft Davis Mills and the. You know, I, I liked him. Going into the 49er game, I was really impressed with Davis Mills. I, I, I felt that way. In college, he got hurt. The ACL coming out of high school. He hardly, he played less than Trey in college. Like 12 or 13 games, yeah. Yeah, he didn't play. He was like Trubisky. He was, you know, but he, he showed some pocket presence. I thought he played really well. Now, the 49er game, they got after their old line that day, and he got rattled. But so did Matt Ryan. So did Matthew Stafford for, for two plus games against the 49er pass rush. So I'm not going to lay that one on him. I think he's, if it's me, I see the, the reason we, we've talked, we I haven't been on this for since October, but I think, you know, my feelings about Garoppolo. Uh, I want him on the roster to help Trey, you know, Mike Florio writes in pro football focus or um, talk. Pro football talk about, you know, does, does Jimmy's presence on the roster undermine the Trey undermine it. It's the opposite. Jimmy Garoppolo is a great guy. They like each other. I think it's good for Trey's development. Nothing in this world, especially in professional sports, should be just given to you. You've got to earn it by your on-field play. Let him beat Jimmy out. And then along the way, Jimmy Garoppolo is going to help him. So he doesn't undermine anything. To me, he helps develop him. Now, Casario could say the same thing in Houston. If I want a good backup quarterback to teach Davis Mills how to be a pro and I know Jimmy from New England. I was there when we drafted the guy. So that's that's somewhat of a scenario. I don't see him going to Carolina. So I don't know. I mean, the injury factor in training camp, but really, they don't play anybody in the preseason. Who's, you know, someone going to get hurt walking down the street? Maybe it happens. But in light and, you know, outside of something unforeseen, I think this is foreseen. Something has got to happen with Deshaun Watson one way or the other. The NFL is going to let him go on this? I, I don't know. So I think those dominoes are. I'm not going to say likely, but they're possible that he could wind up or Cleveland could have interest. You may not be able to broker a trade, well, but I'd rather have him run the Browns without Watson over Jacoby Brissett. Yeah, I mean, the other hypothetical that we had for you and we, we've been talking about is the swap, you know, get Carolina because they want to draft this kid from Liberty who's kind of like a Trey Lance, a big project. You get Jimmy in there to teach him how to operate. Yet they eat some of the Sam Darnold money. You take Sam Darnold back to kind of rehabilitate him and get a guy that if Trey gets banged up has played, maybe Kyle could get his value back type deal. A deal like that, right? Just get a guy. Jimmy's proven that he's a high-level guy, can handle the young guy. Basically the same scenario there. A little different trying to save that guy's job. But, you know, assuming that, you know, Obviously, the variable of the Deshaun Watson trade, that to me, if that was like a 15-game suspension, hell yeah. But if that thing's like six, probably doesn't yeah. make as much sense. Where the Sam Darnold thing is, you also, you know, who knows? Maybe the suspension isn't by training camp, and you're ready to do the pull the trigger, and Jimmy's ready to go, and you could do a deal like that, and the Niners, no point in waiting, right? Yeah. I, I totally Sam Darnold agree. was terrible last year. I mean, there's no way around it. He and he cost $18.85 million. They were, they were three and all with him. I like Sam Darnold a lot. I think we've discussed him. I love him coming out in the draft. He's got to get coached better. I don't, I don't know what he, he turns the ball over too much. He has not played to his ability at all. And you expect some of it. I mean, the first pass he ever made in the NFL was a pick six on Monday Night Football. It's like, what's going on? But I have And then he had the toe and he had the mono. And 
he's had some things off the field that have kind of derailed him, but I like him. Last year, I, I, my private hope, and I said it on the radio, was instead of trading up from 12 to 3 and going to get one of these young quarterbacks, just go get Sam Darnold. Is what I was thinking, and you had. We, we were. Th- I mean, we we were. A lot of people were thinking that. I mean, that yeah, was a I, value. I, I like Sam. Um, I mean, what are you saying, Garoppolo for Sam? Just a swap, straight yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, there was some money. I don't know exactly know how that works, but something like and that. And also yeah. got PJ Walker on that. I, I like PJ Walker from watching him in the Alliance of American Football. I think he's he's <laughs> dynamic. I, I don't know if he's a starter, but I think he's a young. He's laughing, but I do like him. And I the one thing you hear about them with the rumblings and the the owner. Um, Cam may may come back to them at some point again, so I, I could see that. The one the reason I'm more into Cleveland is because I'd rather have Jimmy on a good team where he can make a difference. That's Jimmy's greatest skill is to take a, a good solid team. You're like Belichick. You're rooting for Jimmy to succeed. No, you, no, you... I, I, I'm looking for someone that would take him. And if I'm Cleveland and I don't have Deshaun Watson and I trade Baker, Jacoby Brissett's a fine player, but Jimmy can run this offense. This is the Gary Kubiak offense. It's Mike Shanahan, Gary Kubiak from years ago to Kevin Stefanski. It's it's the 49er offense. With Matt Rule's offense, it's a little collegey. So I don't know if Jimmy's skill set fits completely there. So I'm looking at it more from a scheme standpoint. And then, you know, if I'm I hear you about developing the young guy, Malik Willis. I hear that. And Jimmy could do that. But um he could also, you know, be around Deshaun to some degree. If he gets suspended, he's probably not around the team. But I just feel like Jimmy's value would be what it was here to take a team with a really good running game, a good defense, hit some third downs, manage the game, which I think is underrated. So I think he fits there. And I'm looking at it more as though he, I know he can run that offense. He's run that offense with, with Matt rule in Carolina. Now that's a little more of a, of a hybrid offense that I'm not sure Jimmy would flourish in. John, let's take a moment from Greg Papa to tell the people about indeed.com slash ham. If you don't have players on the field with the right skills, whether it's breakaway speed, elite playmaking ability, you're going to have a tough time winning. The same goes for your business. Indeed is fast. Indeed is simple. It's the way to make sure you're hiring MVPs. Like I said, Indeed.com slash ham is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality candidates that meet your requirements. So if you run an HR firm, you know, if you are in HR in your company, if you're a small business owner, Obviously, we had the great resignation the last couple of years. We need say. people to hire. We feel you. Well, right now, use Indeed.com slash ham. It partners with you on every step of the hiring process to find great talent through time-saving tools like Instant Match, assessments, and here's the key, virtual interviews. Mm. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description, and you can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. And, John, with Instant Match, candidates that you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in the search. There's a ton of assessment tests. You see your top talent's ability faster with 135 different assessment tests. Right now, start hiring and get the $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash ham. Offer go to valid win. through April 30th. Go to Indeed.com to claim your $75 job sure. credit before April 30th. Indeed.com slash ham. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire. You need Indeed. And I also think it's, if you're from Don Yee's perspective, how much are you willing to give up now in your contract to invest in the fact that in Cleveland you're in a much better situation? And so you make you got a one-year shot, whether it's Carolina or Cleveland, to make yourself more money and get somebody to sign you in 2023. So Cleveland puts you in a better position to succeed and get another contract than Carolina would, right? You might be willing to take yeah. a bigger pay cut to play in Cleveland based on the investment in yourself. Yeah, I, I think they want to do right by Jimmy, and they have. John Lynch said it at the owners' meetings that they have allowed Don Yee, who represents Jimmy, to work a trade. But let's be real here: Don Yee's not going to make this trade. He may do the legwork for it to be set up and we'll, we'll get your, you know, we'll tell you where you're going, (laughs) but, and the the bottom line is Jimmy has to want to go to the new team. I understand that he's going to have to agree to it to some degree, but there aren't a lot of uh, open 
no. chair here. If we're playing no. musical chairs, the music's going to stop here. So I, I understand that uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with it. I think agents drive all sports way too much. They, they drove the baseball lockout. Hell, they drive the NBA. They're driving this league. There's no doubt. They're, they're driving this thing. They, you know, Mark Rogers, and Russell's guy, he, he's driving this. And I, to some degree, I hear you. Well, you're not going to tell us how to run our team. We'll send them where we want to send them. If you don't want to go, then don't go. But, you know, so I, I, you have to play nice. I'm not going to be Al, Al, Al Davis on you. But you, don't, you don't think Al Davis would have liked 2022 when well, the agents just... You know, he would have done what he did with Steve Berline. He'd just sit on you. You're not playing. <laughs> if you don't want to go where I tell you to go, I'll tell you where to go. Sit at the end. Home. Of the You're not playing. <laughs> or to Marcus, go sit on your head. So I, I you know, I, but I, I, we're not that. And they're going to do right by him. But, you know, John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, Jed York are going to make this trade. Not Don Yee. But I, but Jimmy will have a say on where he, and I, and I, I wonder, would Jimmy want to go to Carolina? You know, I, it, it, would, would he nix any trade now? I think Jimmy needs to get on the field and play is what he needs to do. He needs to, his contract expires after this year. Now you're saying, are they going to rework it and tack years on? You know, the 49ers have been unwilling to touch that contract, which is really. Well, they, they can't, they can't. I mean, it's. Well, you could, you could stick another, you could have, you could have gotten under the cap early. What I wanted to do was extend his contract. Spread it out, write him a check, keep him, add, you know, what are the Aaron Rodgers void years at the end and just make the, the cap hit a little more palatable. Um, but they, they don't seem to be in any hurry to add any outside players. They don't seem, you know, they got a bench to sign the rookie class. You know, the Bosa Debo thing, I think, is over discussed because you don't have to put a lot of new money no. in. The cap. Does, it doesn't the matter. Cap is gonna go, sure. yeah. The gap's shooting up, you know, maybe 20% a year could get to 300 million in four, five, six years, whatever it is. So I think that's overplayed a little bit. So I hear you, guy, and what, you know, but Don, he's not, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo needs to take ownership of his own career, and the 49ers need to make a trade that's best for them. And, you know, Don, Yee can do all the phone work and all that. But at the end, um, Jimmy's going to say yay or nay, and the 49ers are going to make the best transaction or no transaction for them. One thing Kyle was adamant last year, and I'll give him credit, he never budged. Jimmy's our starter, Jimmy's our starter, and Jimmy was a starter the whole time. Like, he refused. He did not say the same thing in Florida. You know, he did not say Jimmy's a starter anymore. In a con he basically said, if you read between the lines, Trey Lance is going to be the starter, without saying it. He didn't say Jimmy's not the starter. Yeah, but he but he clearly moved off that position. Like I, I To me, my takeaway was, Jimmy is no longer the starter, and Jimmy is not going to be here. Like, Jimmy's era in with the 49ers, I know John said they won't cut him, I'm going to call bullshit on that one if they don't have the option to trade him. Like, I can't see them running training camp with Jimmy Garoppolo. OTAs Why? they get. Why? OTAs is an easy one. Because what do you do? You have a quarterback competition? Why not? Why is that so bad? You just traded the, the farm for this kid. Eventually, you got to let throw him in the yeah, deep end and see what you got. Arrive. Eventually, will arrive. He, he played, he, he started, what, 19 games in college. He threw 318 passes. With all due respect to North Dakota State, and they kicked everybody's ass. It's a lower level. But that's three years. We're in 2022 now. Do. I, I, I don't. That's why I've never wanted to trade Jimmy Garoppolo, and I still wouldn't do it. And you have to be specific what draft pick you're getting back and how, what's the player we're going to draft with him. I don't know how that makes you a better team. I, I, don't, I don't see any problem with bringing Jimmy to training camp and let the best man win. This is competition. And it, it's going to, as I said, do you think that's on the table? Do you think it's on the table that they have a quarterback competition in the fall? I hope so. I, I personally. Well, I know you're rooting for it, but, but I mean, I, honestly, I, not it, because it, I like Jimmy Garoppolo. I like no, I know. Let's go Forty Niners. And if if he if he does develop, if right now John Beck and Tom House and Three D Q B are turning him in to Patrick Mahomes, then we'll yield to that. But I still would want Jimmy on the roster anyway. Because the guy runs a lot, and they have designed quarterback runs, powers and sweeps and keeps and the whole thing, P -p pull option read. He, he gets tagged. I don't want him getting hurt. So I still want Garoppolo on the run. I want two. I want that position to be deep. It's the most important position in all of American sport, and I want it to be the deepest possible because we've seen years go up in flames around here when Jimmy's gotten hurt. Both these guys have shown they get hurt. Um, Jimmy, for other reasons, Trey, because he's a runner. So I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I think it makes you, I don't know why you would weaken an area of strength. Now, if you could trade Jimmy Garoppolo 
for an early day two pick and the Cleveland scenario comes in and they suspend Deshaun Watson the week of the draft and, the, you know, they traded Baker and now all of a sudden Andrew Barry, De Podesta, Cleveland's on the phone. Uh, our season's just, we, our, our season's going to burn like the Cuyahoga Lake years ago. We got to make a trade here or whatever that was, a river, the lake, whatever it was. Um, no one knows. Whatever it is. Uh, terminal Tower joke. You have to be in Northeast Ohio to get my line. So anyway, I I mean, then, you know, give me a specific. I don't know. But I, I hope, I think it makes the 49ers better to bring Garoppolo in. Trey Lance will have his day. Aaron Rodgers waited three years behind Favre. And it's I know tr- times have changed a little bit, why? I would say. Why? between why? 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 It, it, it just has the way that's covered, the money. Well, I don't care about the media. I, I agree, but I mean, it, it impacts these guys. It just does. It's the number one like talking Rogers, point. Play him when he's ready. When he's, you know, Kyle said he's ready. Yeah, he's ready. Is he the most ready he can be? Is he readier than Jimmy Garoppolo is? All I know is, at no point this year, and Kyle can say, you know, go after the Ram game. They were three and five, because they were looking to develop. Now, if they lost that game, then you yeah. switch gears. Now we're going to play Aaron Banks and. We're going to do all that because we don't think we can win. But the bottom line is Jimmy played really well till he got thrown down by Danico Autry, hurt more by Randy Gregory, and then he, he did not play well in the playoffs because he had a bad thumb and he had a bad shoulder. But beyond that, you can win the damn Super Bowl with that guy. And Trey will have his time. I'm not saying – and this is not undermining Trey Lance. It's not – people can't – two things can be true. Jimmy Garoppolo could be the better player last year – and maybe he's the better player in August of 2022. That does not mean the 49ers aired and Trey Lance can't play. It means Trey Lance has to be properly developed to be a player. And yeah, we could play him, but is that the best way we want to go? Now, you know, all that being said, Jimmy does have limitations. I'm not saying he's Patrick Mahomes, but uh, Jimmy's been in the system for a while now. He knows it well. Uh, he does fit what they want to do. So I, I don't see a problem with bringing them both to training camp. I do not. I think that's what football is about. We close the door. We kick the media out. Let's go. And the best player plays. That's the way it should be. That's the ultimate judge of how you should play. And if Jimmy's the best player, play Jimmy. If Trey's the best player, then you know what, Jimmy? You're the backup. And maybe we'll hold on to you to the trading deadline. Maybe we won't trade you at all. Maybe we need you because Trey gets hurt. Something happens. He doesn't play as well. He starts to get fooled post-snap as opposed to pre-snap. It's a hard lead. It takes you a long time to figure it out. And so that, that's kind of where I'm at. And I don't, I don't, you know, if the media can't deal with that, I don't think Kyle Shanahan cares what everybody thinks, to be honest with you. He's going to do what's best for his football team. And having as, as deep as possible of a quarterback room is what's what he's into. But if they call you and say, oh, we got we to get a quarterback. We'll give you a, we'll give you a second round pick for Jimmy. Let, oh, oh. Wow, Adam Peters, who are we going to pick with this pick if they give us the 40th pick overall in the draft? Well, let's do, you know, then then you make a trade if you, if you want to. I, I think it's less crazy if you say, uh, it's not as crazy as I would have thought it would have felt to hear that take, that Jimmy becomes the backup quarterback. Because I've seen this organization not once but twice now have seasons derailed in the last five years by a quarterback injury, Garoppolo's injury. But I would, for me, I would need to say Jimmy Garoppolo is the backup quarterback because to me, the other side of that card is Trey Lance has not played a lot of football. And I think part of the development of Trey Lance needs to be that he needs to play, particularly because the speed of the game is going to be part of his development. I thought he looked really uncomfortable as a runner last year, um, particularly when they were not design runs. And I thought it put him at risk at times. He'd get caught in between a slide and a dive and trying to take on a defender or trying to go out of bounds and he has not played a ton of football. Um, he's cheap. Uh, now, like you said, the cap's going up. Maybe it becomes less less critical that your quarterback is cheap, but I think he needs to play so that in 2023 he's ready or in 2024 he's more ready to really do what you're going to need him to do, which is be your version of Mahomes or Josh Allen. He doesn't have to be as good as those guys, but be your franchise quarterback. So I, I, I don't hate the idea of Jimmy being around if you're saying this is now Trey Lance's team, but – we couldn't get a third round pick for Jimmy, so he's our backup in case something happens. And I don't think anyone would argue with that, right? You'd have the best backup quarterback well, in the league. Would, hey, I think people would. You, you're saying you don't want that, John. Here and Jimmy's over the shoulder, and Jimmy's the better player. 
Don't you play the better? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be close. Like, he can't be significantly better than but Trey. But with football, right you there. only know with the games. And unlike basketball and baseball, with the quarterback, like, it's a hard thing. you just get, you just don't get to play. Think about, I was thinking, what, listening to you talk about Jimmy and Trey, like, when you were calling Raider games by that third year when Derek was in the MVP discussion, or now Josh Allen the last couple of years, a lot of that is because of the of the confidence they build up and the experience they build up those first couple years. Like ultimately drafting Trey, it's weird, right? In 2022, this season is going to be a big season for the 49ers. They're going to have a really good team. They're going to try to compete to win the division, to win playoff games, to compete for the Super Bowl. But like you draft Trey for the next decade, right? And the way like in four years, you look back and like he's way better now because of three years ago, right? Isn't that part of these young players at quarterback where – Debo and Ayuk and Bosa, they get to like rotate in when they're young and kind of feel their way in. And then when they prove it, they just go. That doesn't work that way at quarterback. The only way to truly get better, like obviously you practice in the reps, but the games against defensive coordinators. Yeah, I mean, Derek Carr was 0-10 to start his career. So I, I, it took you a while. 49ers can't. My point is we would all agree, and they've had some major – subtractions I was there yeah. in the off season. You know, they finally won that Thursday night monsoon game against the chiefs. I thought they were going to go in 16. Your guy, Mark Bedane wasn't very happy about my <laughs> own 16 tweet. I remember that. Um, <laughs> the 49ers have lost some key people, but I think when it's all said and done, they feel like they have a super bowl team and they, they, they went to the NFC title game fourth quarter up 17 to seven should have won that game, beat the Bengals in Cincinnati I mean, you could they could say they, they were the best team they should have won this past year. So the team they're going to take to camp next year, the design, the goal is to win the Super Bowl. So my my whole thing, I, I, I understand what you're saying, Guy, about developing track. That's that's critical. I wish there was an NFL Europa or, you know, they had a deal with the X. There isn't. You could, I learned today you can make six figures playing in Japan. Football in Japan? Yes. Well, send, send them there. <laughs> He better they, win the MVP in the Japan League. <laughs> I'm not going to make any height jokes. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't know, I don't know how, how big the D line is. He had a problem with having the ball tipped at the line. Of are America are Americans playing in Japan? I, I don't even know that was an option. I think there. Yeah, there are some Americans playing. Mean, in Japan. I got to do some so digging. Your point is, how do you get better playing football if you don't play football? And I think you know that's what he's doing now with John Beck and Tom House, the 3D QB. Jimmy will not run the team in the off season. He won't he'll get all those reps. Game, so he'll get all the OTA reps. And then we'll see where he's at. Maybe his development. I'm hoping that he comes out of this and was like, wow, he is so far advanced than the guy last year. And what you saw last year, indecisiveness, I think, is the one thing that was when he ran, he hit his back foot. He didn't know to go, where to go with the ball. He gave it one the first game. You know, when he played the second half against Seattle when Jimmy got hurt on October the 3rd, it was one and gone. He was like Kaepernick. If he didn't see the first read, he was Justin Fields. He was gone. And then later, you know, the next game when he started in Arizona, can we go one, two? At least go to two. And then, but they, you know, they, they had so many design runs for that game. He got better as the year went on, but he has a lot more development to do. So, um, and again, I'm basing it on what I saw at the end of last year. No, no one's arguing. No one's arguing with you that he's not a project. We're not. So, so do we? Want I'm in agreement. To, so I don't want to turn 2022 into a developmental year for Trey Lance. But his first year, regardless, whether he starts this year or next year, is going to be, you well, develop he, as your, he, Patrick he, he, Mahomes he developed as rookie Mahomes year. He's going to be further developed in 2023. You well, just well, give him more time to be ready. I think part and of this is kind of. Jimmy's contract will expire. I don't think they're going to extend Jimmy Garoppolo. No. But I, I, I mean, you all have been, I, I just, <laughs> I, how many times, you know, Mahomes was tremendous his first year. There's no doubt. He but didn't they take out. didn't they take a leap of faith that off season? Alex coming off the best season. Like ultimately, he got the one game against Denver. It well, looked better than any game that Trey had. I would agree. But ultimately, Andy took a leap of faith transitioning from Alex. Right. But it was time. I remember. I, I did not like Mahomes coming into the draft. I thought he was reckless. Where he'd hold the ball, he was down here, and he was throwing sideways. Like what the Christ? But you know, I know John Gruden loved him. Uh, you know, Sean, Sean Payton. Payton. Yeah. I mean, he was an elite thrower of the ball. Uh, but I remember seeing him watching the Chiefs video in training camp. And I'm like, who's number 15? Because he was wearing Tom Flores' old number. I was like, 
is that Mahomes? What they with Kafka and uh, Matt Nagy and Andy and whoever else they had on the staff, those guys developed him. He was so much better than what I saw in college. And he was really good in the preseason. He was good. And then when he started that last game against Denver, he was further along. Yeah, he was. It, it was time. It was time. So I don't, I, I mean, I don't, it was never time for Trey this year. Now, again, I haven't seen him in, in months. And we'll, we'll, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to go April 18th when they have OTAs and get a look at him and see what's going on with him. And then maybe it's just, wow, Trey is so much further along and it's a year. And last year, you know, he, he didn't he only played one game the pandemic year against Central Arkansas. He struggled in that game. They found a way to win at the end, but he was off. He looked nervous. It was out of rhythm. It's like watching the Warriors play right now. It's like, what's going on? And then, um, so he, but he's gotten, you know, I, and then the whole offseason preparing for the draft and all the pro days. It's not, yeah, it's not fair. Not the same. This is really when he can get into true developmental time where they, they, they send him to Beck and House and 3D QB and they give him specific things they want him to work on. They did that a little bit after the mini camps wound up last year. And before training camp, they had 40 days to get him ready. Uh, but then he reverted back a little bit. Muscle memory's hard. So, I, I'm, you know, he could take tremendous steps forward. And then I hear you. And then if he beats out Jimmy, Trey plays. But my concern is, and Roethlisberger run, won right away as a rookie. Um, obviously, Andrew Luck won right away as a rookie. I'm not saying it's a Russell Wilson run, won right away as a rookie. RG3 got into the playoff. You can win. It's not like it's impossible. But his level of... Uh, preparedness is you know, they played, you know, 18, 19 games in college, um, 318 of pass attempts. Mac Jones was so much more advanced. I think Mac Jones had double the attempts the one year he played at Alabama and he played great, but there were times, especially in playoff games, cold weather games, as smart as that guy is, he's a rookie. He's not Tom Brady here. He's playing really well, but, and the arm strength came into play, but that's another issue. But there are times it's just he's a rookie. He's not ready to ultimately win them playoff games. In time, he will. That's just my concern, where this is a ready-made roster to win the Super Bowl. They were close in Miami in Super Bowl 54. This past year, hell, they, they were winning the championship game by 10 points going to the fourth quarter. They were close. But I, I just don't want to have a feeling like, damn, the inexperience and naivete – and just, you know, just pre-snap versus post-snap, they're fooling this young guy, and it's going to cost us a chance to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, they didn't they, score didn't score an offensive the touchdown. The defend, like, they also almost didn't get that far, right, in part What's because that? of Jimmy. Well, the mar- like, to John's point, the margins are thin. They, they, they also almost didn't get as far as they did. They almost well, they got to the both. Super Bowl, but they also almost didn't get to the NFC Championship game. or the playoffs, guy. Yeah, Remember we playoffs. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that, that that game was interesting. Week eighteen. I mean, it was trending not great at halftime. Right. Is that it's not like yeah. Jimmy was so cl- like it. We almost he also had a, was hurt. You realize he hurt his thumb. I understand, but it's the second time hurt. now. Hurt his thumb. It's the third, third, third time. Thumb. He's been hurt. He's been wiped out for two seasons. He got hurt three times this year. He hurt his thumb I protecting another injury on a fall. I mean. Well, I know because he was trying to break the hand. He gets hurt. <laughs> That's why I want two quarterbacks. Trey got hurt too. Trey got hurt in a preseason game following through. Yeah. It's a Raider helmet. Fingers jacked. He hurts his knee. That's why I want two. Right? You, you know what's funny? You said Roger sat. I was about to say to you, yeah, but he was playing behind Favre. I'd forgotten how bad Favre was Aaron's rookie year. Do you guys remember how? I'm just looking at the numbers. Was they went bad? four in t- 2005. Right, it was the 05 draft, Alex. Yeah. yeah, they went four and twelve. Brett started every game. He led the league in attempts, threw twenty touchdowns and a, a league high twenty nine interceptions. How did Whoa. he come back and start the next year? Did he have a couple good seasons though? After, yeah. Well, the next year they went eight and eight. He threw eighteen touchdowns and eighteen interceptions. Jeez. And then his wow. last year in Green Bay, they went 13 and three, and he threw 28 and 15, and, and then he went to the Jets. But they had to rework Aaron Rodgers' mechanics. Yeah. Remember the yeah. Tedford thing, and he held it up here by his ear. And it was a work in progress. Drop it. I mean, I, I don't know if Rodgers was 
he wasn't as and, and Alex had to learn going back to that draft. Alex Smith was everything was was Urban Meyer, and he never played under center, so it, he was awkward, you know, initially as well. But yeah, I think if that I didn't realize Aaron's numbers were so or uh, Favre's numbers were that ugly. But I don't well, think Aaron Rodgers was was ready to play. You must not have been right. You're watching I'm, practice. Who's the better player? Four is better than twelve. We got to play yeah. four still. If I'd say far of two has done a little bit, you know, and accomplished by the time Aaron got there, a little different, Jimmy. Right, but he threw 29 interceptions? Jeez. <laughs> but, he, but he throws some picks. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't know well, he kept, I mean, that Jameis had the 30 30 year. I remember <laughs> far throwing 29. That's a. What, what, was, what was your first reaction when you saw, either got a text or saw the headline that Brian Greasy had been hired as the quarterback coach? I was actually out day drinking with Lund. <laughs> <laughs> John, I can't read my phone. What does this say? Where were, where, where, where were you guys? Walnut Creek or Danville? Danville. Danville. Somewhere in the city. Nowhere in the city. Oh. Um, Pre-show. I, I, I know I, I know Brad, Brian Greasy well. I mean, his, first of all, his dad was just, and it wasn't only because he wore those those nerdy glasses, but his dad was such a good player, just such a good, smart player. Miami was just. What would be your like, modern-day uh, Bob Greasy comp? Like, who would he play like? A little before our time. Peyton Manning, but not uh, – and he threw the ball, you know, well. After they lost Zonk and Kick and Warfield, they went to the WFL. He could throw the ball. He had to get some good games. But uh, he would check, you know, how, how they ran the game back then. But, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo had the championship game against Green Bay when he already threw the ball. Greasy had games like that where he threw it like seven times. Yeah. If Miami had run it down your throat. They had two 1,000 yard backs, Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka, and they had Jim Kick. So, anyway, Bob Greasy was a tremendous player and a really good broadcaster and smart. And he was like, you know, he was one of the smartest, you know, Johnny and Itis and the field general and all that. But Greasy of the 70s was so smart, different than Bradshaw and Stabler and even uh, Staubach. He was just so smart. So then his son, you know, goes to Michigan and they win a championship and he's fundamentally really strong player. And, and, and then, Bob, I think one of the Bob started to pop. Bob calls the Rose Bowl with Brian Greasy right. playing in it. That's wow, that's pretty cool. That was, Keith, that was that's incredible. incredible. Without question. And did a great job and was very impartial. That's the kind of pro Bob Greasy was. So anyway, then Brian goes to Denver right at the time at the end of the Elway run. And I remember, you know, one of the most memorable Raider games I ever called. Brian was the quarterback. And the four, the Raiders were, that was the year we were 4-0 to start the year and then lost four in a row. One of the four losses was to Jeff Garcia and the 49ers in Oakland. Um, and we're playing Denver week nine. It was Veterans Day night at Mile High. And Denver's up 7-3. to three, And they're, they're, they're driving inside the 10-yard line. And they're going to take a 14-3 to three lead. And he throws, he forces one over the middle. And Rod Woodson intercepts on the two-yard line. Runs it back 98 yards for a touchdown. And I, I fully believe that flipped the Raider year. They, they wound up going 7-1 and one to end the year. Um, beat Denver at home. And uh, I fully believe Mike Shanahan on that one pass, he flipped on Brian Greasy. He went and got Jake the Snake. He went and got Jake Cutler. He was moving on. So Brian Greasy, but I remember Brian Greasy so well. Then Brian went to Tampa and he played other places. Uh, wasn't a you know, overtly skilled player like his dad, but he was Bob Greasy's son, and he was really smart. He was a good pro, and I loved him as a broadcaster. I, I, I loved him because uh, he, he did Denver Bronco preseason games with Steve Levy before they went to Monday Night Football, and I remember look because I was doing the Raider games then, so I watched all their preseason games. I didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's how they. I think that's how they paired. Wow. Uh, they even well, maybe college it. football, too. College football, too. They were together. I remember them doing an Alabama game early in the year when I was doing college football. But anyway, I, I thought, and then I thought, as the Monday night football broadcast, and that was not a great broadcast. Uh, I like Steve Levy, but his voice is really thin. Lewis Riddick was surprisingly nervous by it all. You know, I think he had more to share. But I thought Brian carried that and was a superb broadcaster. And I remember when we played the Rams on Monday night football, he came to practice. And I had him on the radio show, um, I think that week. And but I never, I never put it all together that he would be a quarterback coach. But when I got, you know, when I was able to read it through our our day drinking haze with Lund, I was like, what? Uh, great hire. And I, I like Rich Gangarello and Shane Day was here before. And 
Um, but I, I, you know, one thing, and I, I hear Jeff Garcia, Jeff would get upset about this, was they hire all these quarterback coaches that some of them never played quarterback anywhere, and almost all of them never played quarterback in the NFL. And I think what you have to go back to like the 90s, the last time the 49ers had a quarterback coach that actually played quarterback in the NFL. And I think Kyle was talking about it at the at the owners' meetings. Smartest player he's ever been around. Yeah. What? Really? Smartest player. Think about that comment. Yeah. And you know, all everything. The fact that he can talk to him about throwing the interception to Rod Woodson to lose a game and maybe lose your job. So the development of Trey Lance, that has got to be this organization's number one goal now. They got a lot of goals, but really how they develop him is critically important. You can draft him, but now you got to develop him. And I, I'm a big fan of Brian Greasy, and I've only been to this company a couple of times, interviewed him a couple of times. And, but for Kyle to say that and then also bring up his media background, how savvy he is, how do you talk to the media when, you, when, you, when you're good, when you're bad? Stay humble, you know, like King Richard, Richard, you know, Richard uh, Williams, the Will Smith role. That was one of the great scenes of that movie was when they won and they got a little full of themselves. He got mad. Stay you humble. think that's a good, was that a good movie? We haven't watched it yet. I like we the talking. movie a lot. I would not have picked Will Smith for King for Richard. Best actor. I thought he was better as Ali. Yeah. Me too. A lot of it was oh. Ali with the breathing and all that. I thought the, the lead actor from Power of the Dog was way better. And I like Belfast as a film. But anyway, I didn't see Coda. But anyway. Um, we're way off target here, but I, I think Brian Greasy's a great hire. I, I liked it when I and I had Romo on uh, Bill Romanowski on my radio show after that next week because Romo Knows played him. with him on those teams. Yeah. He loved Buddy Bobby Brister was his guy, and it was you know who's going to replace John Elway. Brian Greasy got the first crack at it, so that's a really that's that's an important job. Yeah. As much as anything, Kyle and John and Chris Kasarek and D'Amico Ryan's and Bobby Slowick and. Chris Furster, anybody you want to name. And I love, uh, you know, hiring Brian Schneider to be the special teams coach. I knew him with the Raiders for years. Great, great coach. And Brian Greasy's got a big, big job to develop this this young man into being the player they they, they will want him to eventually become. So I was excited by the hire. And I'm, I'm excited to watch him and talk to him and observe how he's going to do this. Niners at Raiders this year, Pop. I know. At least once. Maybe Super Bowl. Oh, how good is the Raider oh. team? I mean, this pretty is the good. Best Raider roster since Super Bowl thirty-seven, and that was yeah, an I mean, old team. Yeah, good this roster. team's young, younger. Young. I mean, that roster that that went to the was Crab Crabtree was on the playoff team. Derek got hurt. I mean, that roster was pretty good, right? Really good <laughs> offensive line. Really good offensive line. Well, I mean, yeah, we were we were rolling. Khalil was a deep boy that year, wasn't he? Crap out of the game. Derek got hurt in. It'd be the he shit out of Indy. Killed the Colts. Yeah, killed, killed them. them. Um, what were we? Eleven and three. What they wind up that year? Twelve and four. Yeah, because they lost to Denver the last game. Mm -hmm. um, and well, it was it, McGloin, it was McGloin and Denver? Hurt. Let's see how this goes. And that didn't uh, go well. What <laughs> was it? McGloin and Denver, and it didn't McGloin go well. Got hurt in Denver, but I remember him warming up. So Derek got hurt. Is that Christmas Eve? I think it was. Trent Cole with the Colts. Bad injury. That was a bad. They they were good that year. Yeah, really good. I, I think we had a chance. I, I I was looking at maybe playing New England in a playoff game, and then Jarrett got hurt. We're in Denver. McGloyd, I think it was New Year's Day. Maybe we're going to play the Broncos. McGloin's warming up, and I know McGloin well. We used to hang out with Condo and those guys, and he was he had the worst. He had a Tim Tebow warm up. He's throwing the ball into the crowd. I'm like, settle down. What are you doing? He's bouncing slants. He was awful. Jeez. So and it was windy that day, as I recall. Then he gets hurt in the game. And who was the guy out of Michigan State that they drafted in the fourth round that had to play the playoff game? What was his name? Uh, not Cook. Cook. Connor Cook. Connor Cook. Connor? No one came to his birthday party. Oh, my. Well, Clowney dominated that playoff game, remember? And Clowney was, was just that, killing people. That was, I, we, how long did we wait for a playoff game? <laughs> that Super Bowl 37. And I'm like, this playoff game turned into a preseason game. I mean, it was, it was like we never could make a first down. But that was a good roster, but you lost Derek. So, I, uh, you know, yeah, I, want, I can't wait for the schedule to come out. What are, the, uh, what are your hypotheticals on when 49ers? Well, and well see, to me, the, to me, the question is, John, let's take a moment from Greg Papa to tell the people about 
Sleep Number. Sleepnumber.com slash ham. Proven quality sleep is life changing. Guy, you want me uh, to give you some tips to improve your sleeping besides just getting it. a sleep number? dot com slash ham bed because they are game changers how about this one and you and i could probably uh listen to this tip mm. avoid large meals and heavy snacks yeah. before sleep set a quality sleep goal that's healthy and realistic for your lifestyle try tart cherry juice for its Typhotidone and melatonin. Tryptophan. It's the stuff from the uh, turkey. Tryptophan. Oh, oh, tryptophan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't. I. I had bad eyes. I didn't see didn't the R. I thought it was you there, tryptophan. Tryptophan. I love turkey, which may promote better sleep. I'm a big melatonin guy. It is a game changer. Record how long you slept. Keep a little journal. You know, it might be tough, but the the melatonin tryptophan. Just a little turkey, a little melatonin. You know, a little dissolver. Boom. Uh, how about a little note thing by your bed? Not just write down what time you went to bed. Then you look back at it, you go, man, long week. And you look down, you go eleven fifty nine, ten thirty seven, midnight. You know, maybe that's snappy in. Hey, or do this. The Sleep Number Three Sixty Smart Bed tracks the total time you sleep oh. and the percentage of your sleep that's restful. Bam. That's why the Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed is such a great option. John firmed it up a little. He's sleeping at a 40. I'm sleeping at a 55. Spend more time with your family. Spend more time with the right peace of mind. You know what studies have shown, Guy? When what? you get the Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed, you get almost 100 hours more of proven quality sleep a year. You know, Guy, sleep is precious. Productivity goes up. The better well-rested you are, the more alert you are, the more you can close deals, dominate at your job. And uh, then you make more money, have more time to vacation. You know what you do when you get out of bed, John? You, you swing your feet down, you put on some socks, and you put them in your deal sleds. Those are oh. the shoes you wear oh. when you make deals. Discover special offers now at a limited time at your Sleep Number store or go to sleepnumber.com slash ham. Sleep Number, proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. Do it. It's different because Josh has taken over a talented a team that just won 10 games. Kyle, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch – Save the 49ers, right? I mean, they were headed, they were in a bad spot and they just, they wanted Resurrect, Josh. Resurrected. And, yeah, resurrected, save, however we want to, yeah. you know, describe it, but they've, they've got him back rolling again. Josh McDaniels, you know, obviously you had a front row seat those two years when he was there, a disaster. I mean, no one thought he'd come back out. It was kind of a weird spot, turns down the Colts. Now he takes his job. He's kind of chubby now. What, what's your take on <laughs> on Josh? Obviously, he's a great I, I, assistant coach, but that time in yeah. Denver, now he's way younger. But and I, I think he evolved. I mean, I watched him his whole career in New England. Obviously, Charlie Weiss was there for the early Brady years. And um, Would Al Davis have hired him, you think? He was supposed to come in. So when Lane Kiffin was hired – I remember it well. Steve Sarke he wanted Steve Sarkeesian. I remember him calling one day, and uh, he, he was talking to John Kingdon, and he, I, I remember him being involved, and he said, uh, "Who do we have? Who do we? Who was here before um, that was on the staff that we should look at?" And I, he, I think Kingdon brought up Sarkeesian because Sarkeesian was they were co-offensive coordinators. Remember Sarkeesian and and Lane, yeah. Al wanted Sarkeesian. And I remember this so well. It was a Friday. This was when Al Davis was probably at his most desperate. He called me and said, he won't come. He won't, he won't take the job. And I'm going, what? He won't he said he won't he won't come. Which is unheard of for a coordinator in college not to take yeah. a head coaching NFL job. Ahead. And Sark was here as a quarterback coach earlier. Yeah. So that was the connection. And then I, then he spins in the in the lane. And I, I don't know where that went. I think, honestly, Lane's then wife, Layla, kind of swooned Al a little bit. He was kind of enamored with her. I don't know. And then he liked, he liked Lane because Lane was in charge of coordinating. At yeah. that point, he wanted you know somebody to actually um, be a pseudo-GM and, and cultivate talent. And because Kiffin did that at USC like Al did here, he was yeah, kind yeah. of enamored by that. Um but then I remember, so he hires Lane Kiffin on a Sunday night. And the word was he was going to bring Josh McDaniels. It was the year New England was playing Indy in that playoff game. It, but many of them, obviously. But it was the one in the Dome in Indy. Where Peyton uh, finally won. They were up. New England was up 21-3, to three, remember? Yeah. And then New England, um, Indy came back and beat them. 
And so McDaniels was available. It was that Sunday night. And I remember Al saying McDaniels is coming in that night to be, we're going to interview McDaniels. And then Monday morning rolls around and McDaniels never came. He Al canceled the interview. Because he lost? He hired no, he hired Kiffin. Oh. He already decided to hire already decided to hire Kiffin. I'm like, what? Why would you hire Josh McDaniels? Well, it would, it would have failed either way because Josh in his in his early thirties was for, not ready. Al, he would have fought. I don't know. I mean, Lane was so disrespectful of Al, he never should have taken the job. Uh and Al was, you know, difficult to deal with then. But um, I hope Josh would have been more respectful of what he wanted. Otherwise, why interview for the job? And maybe he wouldn't have taken the job. But anyway, I, I, Josh McDaniels evolved. I think he's a brilliant play designer, play caller. I, I watched him like I watched a young Kyle Shanahan and thought, who is this guy? Because he changed. He when they, got, when they got Moss, they were throwing it vertically Deep, down the yeah. field, running nine routes. Then when they got... Aaron Hernandez and Gronk, they're running all these tight ends on the field. And then they got that James Devlin, the fullback, who was a road grader. And they're lining up in 21, 22 personnel. And they're just running it down your throat. And I'm sure Belichick had a lot to do with that. But he evolved to his personnel where I thought, this guy, he's as good as there is. And then all the you know the double passes, the trick plays. Um, he just at the right time, he'd call. He'd sit in a run Baltimore playoff game. He saved it. By running the double pass, he just he just had a way. Would, would Al would Al Davis though have ever okayed a first and second round pick for a four five five wide receiver? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, that wouldn't happen at all. But um, even even if he was good as Devontae, he still Devontae, would have been. No, but Devontae can uncover that guy's special. He doesn't run four five. And he, he says he doesn't. Back. He says he doesn't run four five anymore. What is Devontae? Run? Devontae says he's faster than that. He has to be. Well, I, who cares? Yeah. If he's got a well, third yeah. and three and he's got to shake you off the line, he's going to get open and then, you know, back shoulder you. But anyway, jo- Josh McDaniels, when I saw him as the head coach in Denver, just awful game manager, just terrible. Like he he, he ran the game like the offensive coordinator, like he, he fourth down. I mean, now they're going forward on fourth down like it doesn't matter. But he, I remember so many games. There was one in Denver in particular with the Raiders that I thought, he just gave us the game. What is he doing? They're the better team, and he screwed around with game management. You like like, McV- like McVay in the NFC Championship game with the timeouts? Yeah, against Tampa? <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm saying Sean McVay against San Francisco with he blowing all the timeouts. Well, I, no, how about the game in Tampa when he called, when he challenged the call and he gave Tampa the extra play, the, the next Insane. play four runs in for a touchdown? I mean, McVay's terrible. He's bad at game management. Bad. That's not his strength. There's some, I'm so is Herman Edwards. There's some guys that are bad at it. But anyway, I, he was bad. And then the whole Tebow thing, I didn't get what he was doing there. But they, you know, they won the one. But I, I expect him to be a much – he looks different. He just said he's gained a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully he's gained a lot. I, and the one thing he did say, and I was kind of wondering if Kyle Shanahan would want to listen to this. It was well, He was talking right after he got hired at the Combine. And they said, I have, I have two jobs. My job is to be the head coach on game day and be the play caller on game day but i'm not i don't want to be the offensive coordinator and i thought that was really interesting Hmm. where what he's saying is i can't run the football team and it's complete breadth of what i need to run and micromanage everything with the offense i need to let the offense you know the design and all that i'm going to call it on sunday and that's what i'm great at and then I got to run the game and run everything. I got to be the leader. I got to stand in front of the room. I got to be the head coach of the team. And then I got to make decisions when to challenge, when to go for. I got to run the game and I got to manage men. But he said, I don't want to be the offensive coordinator. And I don't even know who the Raiders hire as their offense. They hired Mike Lombardi's son, Mick. Yeah, he's, I know him well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is he ready for that? That's quite a leap of faith. Well, I bet Josh has been working with him now for a couple of years. He's confident that he can basically put together the plan and then, you know, they can work together. Yeah, he's Mike weekend. McDaniel. Yeah, he can be oh. as Mike McDaniel, exactly. But I thought that was really. But hasn't Kyle done that with McDaniel on the floor, though, the last several years? He's still really involved. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not in the meeting room. I don't know. Um, and he likes Bobby Slovak now and, you know, LaFleur and McDaniel. Yeah, I think to some degree, but I think. I think his. It, his offense is his baby. Yeah, well, but he, what makes Kyle so good is his knowledge of defenses and how to attack defenses is really 
It's interesting. And he attacks individual players, but he attacks schemes. He knows the philosophy, um, you know, going back to, to being around, you know, Monty Kiffin and all that years ago and then, uh, learning from his coordinators and the cover three. And he just knows the rules of how to play defense. So if he's got the code on what you're supposed to be doing, he can set you up and let you do what you're supposed to do if you're fundamentally sound. And I think where they get in the most trouble is when guys freelance against them, like Clowney, or you get defensive players like Aaron Donald that just does whatever he wants based on hunch. Those guys are hard to block sometimes because they don't, he doesn't know exactly what they're going to do. I think yeah. Kyle's real strength is his, his knowledge of defenses. But yeah, I just thought McDaniel, when I heard that, I was like, wow. That's that is a smart way to say it. He, he, he just he call it on Sunday. Or the other thing is coaches do when they become head coaches is they give up play calling on Sunday. Like, stupid. What? Why did I hire you and give you all this money? Because I watched you call plays on Sunday. Call the plays on Sunday. Don't do that. But maybe don't, talks. don't we don't, you know, work so hard Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, have it all come together as a team, let them run it, and then but when Sunday one o'clock rolls around, call the call the game and run the game. I found, uh, we'll finish with this. I found the date for when Niners Raiders should play. Okay. Sunday, September 4th. It's the 20th anniversary of. That's, a, that's not, the season hasn't even started yet. Well, I know. It's or a shame. Play the preseason? Scott, Scott Hatterberg's uh, 20 year, he should light the torch. <laughs> We're not, wait a minute. The, the, the Raiders aren't playing Kansas City. <laughs> It's not. It's not A's Royals. <laughs> you, I think they play play that day. Are you the... segueing to a baseball question? Is that no, that was it. That's all. You don't I think Mark know. Davis would I let Hatterberg Hatterberg play the universe for you? Uh, I I mean I watch it. I it's on TV all the time. All the time. I, you know, I, I get a quarterly check from SAG after for them. So I need yeah. you. how much? What's some, your biggest? Uh, depends on how much you're buying it. Some sometimes it's thirty three bucks. Sometimes it's thirteen. Sometimes it's sixty three. Has never been. Watch. Has it ever been like uh, thirteen hundred or anything? No, never been that. No, never been that. <laughs> did no, you get? Never. Did you get paid for the movie? Just wage. Just. Just pay. like. Like nothing. I don't know. Not much. How did that happen? Did they come to you and say, "Hey, can you can you call the games like you would normally?" Yeah, Bennett Miller, his staff called me. This is going way back. Were you around Brad I wasn't and Jonah? Doing the A's then. I wasn't doing the A's. I was doing the Giants, and um, he calls me. They, so I go out there one day. Ray Fossey refused to be a part of it. So it was me and Glenn Kuyper. Um, Korak was there. What was what was Fossey's stance? Like, I'm not a Hollywood guy? I don't know. I never really <laughs> asked him. He didn't want a part of it. God rest his soul. He yeah, was, RIP. Ray was he had, his, he had his principles. I don't know. So I go there one day. Early, early in the morning, I had to be there. Eight o'clock, they put me in makeup and a trailer. And uh, Brad Pitt I was I actually went on a Friday night and watched them see, film the scene that the twentieth game against the Royals when they blew the lead, and that Tejada about you know flubbed the double play ball. That I saw them run that scene six thousand times, and Brad Pitt was there that night. There was supposed to be a scene where I was on the field with Brad Pitt talking like Billy before the, on, on the, uh, around the batting cage. So we were actually going to do it that night and we never wound up doing it. Uh, but Pitt was there. He was very cool. But the day that I went that one Monday, whatever day it was, I was there all day long. I was there from eight in the morning, whatever it was eight at night. I'm, I'm just doing nothing. I'm just sitting there. They would wait for me. Uh, I met Philip Seymour Hoffman. It was right after he, uh, he did Capote, which was just epic work. So I gave him the classic, uh, you know, great, great work. And when it, he just, and you're a, you're a big movie guy. That had to be pretty cool. He completely ignored me on a level. You've never been ignored <laughs> in your life. He just didn't even acknowledge I was alive. And I was like hugging the guy. I'm like Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> he just, he just, I don't know if he was into his art. How he was into art. How yeah. he, was, he was, you know, going method actor. Method. He could, I mean, Brad Pitt chatted me up, and this guy had nothing to do with me. He didn't say a word. I was like, whoa. He was, was getting ready to make Art Howe look like Jerry West. I'm like, maybe you should ask me some more questions, because he didn't play Art Howe very well. Yeah, he's actually no. like Jerry West. So then, um, so then Bennett was a classic director. So finally, they put us in the in the TV booth, me and Kuiper. And Bennett Miller, the director, walks in, puts his hand out, 
somebody puts a cup of coffee in his hand and he just turns to me and says, do what you do. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Well, normally I don't wait around 12 fucking hours for you to show up. So I've already read ass. So I don't know. So I start doing, we don't know. So we, we reenact um, different games. It wasn't the 20th game. It was a bunch of games. Then I had to read a, a pile of scripts just, you know, over and over. I remember going into a sound studio and then, so I did like two days and maybe eight, 12 hours. And I thought it was done. Then one day they called me and they said, uh, we're trying to find the, the, the get your call, the 20th way, the, the 20th game of the win streak. Where is it? Like, oh, I never, I never called the game. <laughs> we didn't do that game on TV. Yeah. The one time I got into a fight with Ted Griggs, my boss, uh, cause the giants were obviously having a pretty good year that year. Boss is pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the Giants were playing, I think the Dodgers, we were, you know, it was 20th game. I begged Ted, I'm like, you don't understand. They're going to win 20 in a row. We got to broadcast this game. They only have one station at the time? They didn't yeah, have we the didn't, two? We didn't have, uh, it wasn't the double? Sports, it was Fox Sports, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have the second channel and all that. And we got <laughs> <C-A's>. <laughs> You know, we did a lot back then was like if the Giants were in Atlanta for a four o'clock game, we'd jump in in the third inning. You know, whenever the Giants game was over, I don't remember it being the other way around. One time, Terrence Long Probably made not. an incredible catch. At <laughs> no. I remember Terrence Long made an incredible catch out by the garage door at Fenway to beat the Red Sox. And um, we got it. We were late getting into the Giants game. And we heard that. Yeah. Like, My fault. What the hell do you want me to do? <laughs> um, but anyway, so we didn't do that game. Dan Schulman did it on ESPN. So they then they said, so where's the game? So I they, they had me come back in and recreate it one day for like a long time. And then I finally turned to him and I said, why don't you just take Bill King's calls? They're like, who? I'm like a radio voice of the A's that like, go, just go take his, take his call. So I I wound up getting edited out of the movie because of that. But they took a lot of Bill's calls from the 20th, uh, 20th game. So that was a fun, that was a fun time. Have I know you, you've told the story in the podcast before about, about uh, Dr. Buss and interviewing Kareem or magic. Have you seen the winning time? Everyone. What, what, what's what's your take? Haven't been kind of lived it. You've seen them. Well, I. We you think it's unfair? It. Is it unfair? I mean, you. It's. So I I I talked about it on the radio. I talked about it with you guys. My son Derek, you know, we talked about getting the rights and show, you know, Showtime. And my thing was it was the most sexual, sensual, professional sports team in history. From Doctor Buss, who was Hugh Hefner. Yeah. To Jerry West, who was a sex addict admittedly, to yeah. Pat Riley, to Magic Johnson, to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I mean, where do we want to go here? Was Kareem a big, like, sleeping around women? Yeah. yeah. So I, um, and I saw, you know, a lot of, I remember being at the old uh, Red Onion, it was a bar in the Marina Del Rey. Like, my first year in the NBA, I was 21-22 with the Pacers. This was the pickup bar in Southern California. And I'm there with, I'm at a table of like eight, 10 young women. So smoking hot. And they describe themselves as Dr. Buss's girls. And I'm like, what do you exactly do for Dr. Buss? <laughs> so that, that is your Rod the Lakers. He's Hugh Hefner. And one time when I went to interview Kareem, he, he, I said, Kareem, can I get an interview? He said, yeah, sure. He never turned his back. You know, he's got his chair and he's putting his, in his locker stall. So I'm like, how the fuck am I going to know? I had to reach around him. And I'm like, so while I'm doing the interview, I remember so well, Michael Cooper's just running around like a child. He's always like running around. He's like oh, pointing to the, uh, the training room. And I'm like, what's going on? And he's like laughing. He's like, so I'm like, I finished the interview with Kareem and Gary Vitti, the Laker trainers in there taping ankles. And Dr. Buss is right by the ankle taping table doing what Dr. Buss does. He's banging a woman running around. I'm like, this, is that the owner? I'm like, what's going on? This is like that's insane. The next level. So they, they, they the John C. Riley character is that is Doctor Buzz. He's doing a good job. He's doing He's a good getting job. Getting into <clears throat> you know it's the the women and just everything. It, it, and um, the Jerry West depiction is just so <laughs> unfortunate. It's just terrible. Jerry West was not a. He was the opposite. He was a sullen, you know, more introspectful. Couldn't get a hold of him kind of guy and. He would blow up. He did not drink. To have him in his underwear 
on the floor of his of his house just pounding tumblers like <laughs> pop i was saying it you can take a lot of liberties the second you put a guy in tidy whities curled up on the ground drunk. And it's Jerry fucking West. You've crossed the line. <laughs> I mean, it's not even. I remember when West wrote his autobiography and he got into his father and the domestic violence. Mm. So I interviewed him at uh, the old warrior facility in Oakland, the Clorox building, in front of like season ticket holders. There's probably three or 5,000 people there. And I spent um, Raymond Ritter and, uh, you know, we got me, me West and Raymond in, the, in a green room before because I wanted to. I was like, how much do you want to, you know, you're Jerry West. How much do you want to get into what your dad did? I mean, and he just broke down. I, I mean, I knew him some, but not that well, where he really confided in me. And I was like, I'm still a little uncomfortable with the subject matter. We got into it because it was part of his book. So there was that Jerry side. Um, more what about that. the depiction of Pat Riley? I thought he was like a GQ well, guy. It makes him look kind of like I mean, a pussy. Brody's nose. I mean, I, and then his hair's all haggard and they make him out. I mean, and then, so then, you know, obviously, and Kareem, that's Solomon Hughes, the former Cal setter. I called a lot of his games. Um, I, Kareem was a brooding guy. I mean, I think Kareem's big problem was his height. He felt it's hard being so, he was so tall. How tall was he? Seven two. Seven two, seven three. I mean, he was just even. Obviously, basketball players are tall, and back then they were taller. But he was just so huge. I remember the first time I ever met him. My first year in the NBA during the Pacers, we played the Lakers in a Hall of Fame game in Springfield, Mass. And the Lakers come in, and it's the, it's the middle of their their Showtime run. And Kareem, there was a he was standing by a bank of elevators, uh, elevators on the lobby. And all these fans were coming down. Basically, he had a choice to make, whether to stand there and get on the elevator and be mobbed by all these people, or what he chose to do was he ducked into a stairwell and he walked up the flight of stairs. And I remember like, what the, what's he doing? So I followed him into the stairwell. And rather than take the elevator, be, be around all those people and take the elevator up to his room, he decided to walk up like six flights of stairs to avoid people. I mean, that's, and I think that was, and I remember I had a great interview with Kareem when I was doing Chronicle Live years ago. And, uh, you know, he's done some great work. Um, he's a really smart man, but his, his height, his enormity, I mean, he, he made it you know, like, he felt like he was a giraffe. And it wasn't so much his skin color, but it was just how tall he was. So it, I think a lot of that was just Kareem really not being comfortable being himself and, and comfortable in his own skin because people didn't treat him like he was normal. Like I remember traveling with Manute Bowl and Manute was mm. seven, seven. Jesus. But Manute, Manute would have fun. And I, I would always, when we went through an airport, I would walk behind Manute just to see like people's reactions when he walked by. It's like, how could you, I'm not like a, a zoo animal. I mean, it's just, it's, he is a human being. And I remember, you know, going through Chicago Airport O'Hare and like a lady, like physically, like on the ground, like looking up at him, like he was a, a zoo animal, like a giraffe. And it was uncomfortable, but he would, have, he wouldn't, he wouldn't not hide like Kareem. He'd walk right down the middle and be minute and swagger and have the funniest line. I remember one lady comes up to him in an airport and she says, who, who are you? Who are you? And he says, I'm Ed Too Tall Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. He kept walking. But <laughs> Manu was cool and he had the personality to deal with it. I think a lot of Kareem's uneasiness was it was just hard being Kareem Abdul Jabbar. I think one thing cool about that show is that it makes you realize because every even the poorest Mark Davis is cutting seventy million dollar checks now. Everyone has rich in pro sports, right? I guess a couple of baseball, but back in the sixties, seventies, and even the eighty early eighties, right? I mean, some of the, these businesses were not all thriving. I mean, this was the Lakers and Jerry Buss was the way they're depicting it. Who knows if it's true or not? But I would imagine you know those first couple of years were probably pretty ugly for the Lakers. Well, right? I mean, the Lakers were after they moved from Minnesota and Mike and won five titles in six years and. They're there in 60 and they get Elgin and Jerry and, um, you know, they were in the finals every year. They didn't yeah. win. But then the 71, 72 team with, you know, and Elgin retired early in that year, but they had Cal Goodrich and Jerry and, and uh, Jim McMillan and, and Kareem. And 
that was one of the glitziest star teams of all time uh, with Wilt. But then after the post Wilt years, they were down. You know, they they then they made the trade to get Kareem from Milwaukee, and West did coach those teams. A lot a lot of this this winning time is just factually incorrect on the timelines and everything. But they were down. You know, the Lakers were not. That was a a, a, a bad time. And overall, for the NBA, you started to get into the drug culture, which was even more so in the 80s. Um, those games were on tape delay. They weren't live. You think about it now, those games were replayed on, you know, 11 o'clock at night on the East. It was just incredible. So the league was down. In, in Jack Kent Cook, you could get a deal on the Los Angeles Lakers because they, they still had the name, but they weren't the marquee franchise they were. So Dr. Buss got it at the right and he was getting divo- And the divorce was real. Right. Uh, who's Jack Kent, Kent Cook's yeah. divorce? Yeah. yeah, and and so he needed the he needed the cash. He was yeah, moving. I mean, to, he was things. moving to Have Nevada. You guys been watching this? You yeah, watch yeah. The I've I've watched I've every episode. Into the book too. Well, how about the uh, the Perlman's book, and then Scott Osler wrote a book. So in episode three, where he's luring Tarkanian, yeah, and the mobsters in Vegas kill the guy, champagne, and then it, the, uh, it, this guy winds up dead in the back of the rolls. Yeah. Did they kill? Did they? Did the mob in Vegas kill that guy to keep Tarkanian from going to the Lakers? When that happened, you know, I'm watching the show. I pause it and I I type it in. In Perlman's book, he claimed that that guy who was Tarkanian's guy had separate issues with the mob, was a big gambler, and was in the hole to them at the time, eighty, a hundred grand, which probably modern day millions of dollars. So they killed him because they were on. It was separate from Tarkanian, but it does feel like the mob probably well, loved Tark and didn't want to. Was if you take Tark from UNLV, you're going to wind yeah. up in a trunk. He and Perlman claimed in the book that the guy owed the mob a bunch of money and well, had been avoiding the mob guys. I I I just listened to that part of the book. That guy was laundering money for the mob and was skimming. Too. Yeah, he was he was in deep, he and they told him stop skimming. Anyway. He was getting killed. So you know. had nothing to do with it. That's the way Perlman made it. It was claim. right after Tark had agreed to terms. So it was like that day or the next. Right after that, he winds up dead Otherwise, right after. Tark, Tark is better coach the Lakers. Well, P- Tark was still taking time to decide. And his kids still wanted to stay in Vegas, and his wife liked Vegas. But how famous was, would you say Tark was in the, like the early '80s? Pretty famous or? Yeah, but you remember how bad of a coach he was in the NBA? I, <laughs> He's coaching the San Antonio Spurs. For like a week, right? It was. I remember him calling. He didn't know how to call a 20-second you know, timeout in the NBA. You go like this. He was like. <laughs> 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 who, was wor- who was worse? T- t- <laughs> I mean, what, t- is he, what is he playing? Was he called the Hawk play? Who <laughs> was worse? Tar- the Tark worst, or- worst NBA coach ever. Tark or Spurrier? Tark or Spurrier? Uh, Tark. <laughs> Tark's, Tark's next level. He didn't know, coach. It's like that's incredible. Up. You'll have to fly away. Just terrible. But uh, I'm enjoying it, even though I'm like, it is on, this entertaining. Is the but actors it, do a good job. But the whole point was, I was onto this team, and the whole sec. I mean, the whole Doctor Bus and his harem of women, and and then they're getting they're they're not backing away from Magic's uh, sexual appetite. No, <laughs> pretty strong. <laughs> who's Genie's? Who's Genie's mom? Jerry, the one that Jerry Buss divorced. I don't. I don't. Oh, that, so she had like a I, real stable mom, not one of these women just coming through. No, she they, he, when he, he obviously divorced her, and I, I don't know the one where. So the end of episode four, does she actually buy the team? Does Buss's mom sell the team to Buss's ex-wife? That's I don't think I, they actually had to sell it. I think they just put it in her name. Well, they needed her money in because there was, and they yeah. owed an extra three million dollars because of Jack Ken Cook. The whole thing's fascinating. That, that, we've seen four episodes so far, and the Lakers haven't played a game yet. No, I know. I'm like, what's Magic's rookie year going to start? Let's go. I, I, was Norm Nixon a good player? I'm kind of fascinated by Norm yeah. Nixon. So he had, you know, you know, his wife from Fame. Uh, she was a she was a movie star. Um, he had a, the word was he had a cocaine issue, and then that was probably West's. He made a lot of great transactions, obviously. Uh, drafted, you know, uh, the whole Kobe and trading Vladi and everything. Yeah. But the essential thing there was, and I think they're doing a decent job. You know, Norm Nixon was a ball-dominant point guard, and you had Magic Johnson, who needs the ball. And so they clashed. Um, when, when Jerry traded 
Norm Nixon for what turned out to be the fourth overall pick in the draft that year, and they took Byron Scott. That's what took that team to the next level, because they could put Magic, not have Norm Nixon. Norm was a combo scoring point guard. Um, what was her name? Diane Allen? What was her name? Allen. She was in uh, his wife's name. She was in fame. Um, beautiful woman. Anyway, uh, he got traded to the Clippers, and the Clippers weren't good. And um, so, but then you put Magic on the ball next to Byron Scott, and you you had one of the greatest, you know, combinations in the backcourt. So, and I remember, you know, when the Warriors and West was involved in that, when they traded, uh, you know, Monte Ellis for Andrew Bogut and that trade, um, I likened it to, to what West did with trading Norm Nixon for the rights to Byron Scott. Is it made the, magic magic and made Steph Steph? I mean, a little right. the you leader, know. <laughs> the player from the roster who was getting in the way of Steph, and then later you get Clay Thompson. You get. Steph I mean, J- Jerry's a fucking Jerry's a fucking basketball genius. So that's why they make him out to be just a, you know, just to, 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 and a I degenerate this, alcoholic. This is not a documentary. It's a, it's not fact. It's for our entertainment. But there should be. But how some. many kids are growing up thinking Jerry West is a fucking lowlight? Yeah, I know. I mean that that's. And you can't sue, and it's just, it's just, when you're actually dealing with real people and real human events, the, the, the truth should be, now, I, we invited Perlman on my on the radio show, and I was going to, t- but I didn't read his book. You read his book, guy? I'm listening to it right now. I got to, so I, I, it was weird because I was going to tear into him, and I thought, but I, I read everything in there is true. When I was going to press him on, so especially the West stuff, just now. But Perlman wrote the book. It wasn't so much the guy who made the movie. But anyway, I, we had Perlman scheduled to go on the show with us, and that's the day Russell Wilson got traded. So like he was, I think he was going to come out at eleven o'clock. We're like, we're off of that train. We got to go with uh, what's going on here. So we didn't wind up having him on. But um, I mean, some of it that the way they're depicting West, Pat Riley, it's just unfortunate, and to some degree Kareem. But I, I think Kareem and is somewhat of an accurate depiction. He was a brooding guy then. All right. Okay, we'll let you get back to life. <laughs> we, we got an hour and a half? Almost. I mean, hour well, 20. counting us chatting, I'm probably. Looking at my, I'm looking at my phone here. And it's, what we, what do you got on deck? What, what, what are you doing tonight? I'm doing more podcasting. Who are you and podcasting with? No. no. I'm free. I'm a free agent. You guys, I think we got to change the name of this. The Haberman yep. and Middlecoff podcast featuring whatever you want Greg to call Papa. me. Big Greg Papa. Pop. Big whatever Papa. You whatever you want. Brought to you by Big O Tires. We don't have that anymore. <laughs> T- Tito's. <laughs> if, you, if you can get them on board. Yeah, Big O Tires. You know. yeah, Tesla? I Tessie? I do. I need, a new, I need a new set of tires. It's the close to <laughs> <laughs> Wow. All right. Nine minutes. Are we done? We, you don't want to We're good. Thanks, Greg. We good? Thank Appreciate you, it. Good to see you.